coral reefs also face challenges from ocean acidification. As you have heard, rising levels of carbon dioxide have driven large-scale changes to the pH and carbonate chemistry of the world's oceans. As carbon dioxide has moved into the upper layers of the ocean, the pH has decreased along with the concentration of carbonate ions. Reduced carbonate ion concentrations make the process of precipitating calcium carbonate into the skeletons of corals and other organisms much more difficult. There have been a large number of studies that have explored the effect of ocean acidification on the calcification rate of reef building corals. This table is from a paper by Joni Klepas and Chris Langdon, which has assembled a summary of the many studies that have investigated how changing the chemistry of seawater is likely to affect the calcifying activities of reef building corals. While corals show a great range of sensitivities to ocean acidification, with some showing greater impact than others, there is an overall decrease in calcification when CO2 concentrations are increased. Dr. Klepas, by the way, was one of a small group of scientists who first identified ocean acidification as being of great concern for marine calcifiers like corals. Her paper in 1999 was extremely important in highlighting this important issue. In studies of the impact of ocean acidification on corals, it has been useful to relate how calcification varies with the so-called aragonite saturation state. The aragonite saturation state is calculated by multiplying the concentration of calcium ions by the concentration of carbonate ions and by dividing this product by the solubility constant for aragonite at a particular temperature. You will remember that aragonite is the crystalline form of calcium carbonate that's used by corals to build their skeletons. The aragonite saturation state varies with the average temperature of the ocean, primarily because carbon dioxide likes to dissolve in cold water more than warm water. Consequently, the highest aragonite saturation states exist at the lower latitudes and the equatorial regions of the planet. When one surveys the literature, it becomes clear that the carbonate reef systems of the world are restricted to oceans that have aragonite saturation states of 3.3 or more. Take a look at these figures. The pink dots represent the location of carbonate reef systems today. The numbers in the corner of each slide represent the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, being 280 parts per million for the pre-industrial period, 380 parts per million, which approximates to today, and 500 parts per million for the future. Now, see how the pink dots are restricted to the blue areas, which is where aragonite saturation state is more than 3.3. At lower atmospheric CO2 concentrations, like those of the pre-industrial, the blue areas are significantly expanded. At higher atmospheric CO2 concentrations, however, the blue areas have retracted to a small part of the tropical regions of the planet. Note particularly how many of the pink dots now fall outside the blue areas and into those areas that are yellow. These are the areas that are below 3.3 in terms of the aragonite saturation state. This highlights the concern that many people have for the changes that are occurring in the chemistry of the oceans as we pump more CO2 into the atmosphere. The implications of these changes in concert with elevated sea temperatures suggest that we may lose the ability of reef building corals to calcify fast enough to maintain the carbonate balance of coral reefs. But can we tell whether these changes are unusual or not in the long term? Information from ice core studies provides information for answering this question. Working with information on the temperature and the concentration of atmospheric CO2 over the past 420,000 years from the Voskot ice core series, it is possible to reconstruct how the temperature and carbonate ion concentrations have changed over the past 420,000 years. Three important issues arise out of this analysis. Firstly, conditions within today's tropical oceans are highly unusual relative to the temperature and carbonate ion concentrations seen over the past 420,000 years, despite the fact that there were several ice ages during this period of time. Secondly, the rates of change in temperature and the carbonate ion concentration are the highest over this period of time. And lastly, 
tropical oceans are rapidly approaching two important thresholds. The first being the concentration of carbonate ions at which carbonate reef systems will no longer be able to be maintained by the calcification of corals and red coralline algae. The second being the thermal threshold above which corals will experience annual mass coral bleaching and mortality. In summary, our current climate change trajectory is pushing coral reef ecosystems closer to a point at which they will no longer be coral dominated. This figure summarises the transition from today where corals are struggling but there are still coral dominated ecosystems in many parts of the world to conditions in the middle panel where carbon dioxide has risen to 450 parts per million and sea temperatures are an additional degree warmer than they are today. At this point, corals are likely to be minor members of tropical coastal ecosystems as they lose out in competition with other organisms such as macroalgae and cyanobacteria. If we keep pushing up the concentrations of atmospheric CO2, we'll get to a point in the right panel where most organisms are struggling with the extra heat and acidity of tropical waters. At this point, and this is speculation, cyanobacteria may be the only obvious winners as coral reef ecosystems shift towards states which do not provide the ecological goods and services that the coral dominated reefs of today do. This has serious implications for the 500 million people that are estimated to depend on coral reefs for food and livelihoods. I want to now finish by bringing together our understanding of how ocean warming, acidification and tropical coastal ecosystems interact, particularly with respect to what we might do to solve the problems that they face when it comes to local and global stresses. The first point that needs to be made up front is that solving local issues is inextricably linked to solving global climate change issues. Both sets of drivers, for example, interact. Reducing coastal pollution, for example, will enhance the ability of coral reefs to recover after mass coral bleaching and mortality. And perhaps slightly more bluntly, a failure to act on global climate change will mean that attempts to solve local problems such as overfishing and coastal pollution will be impossible. Well, one important last question is, how much do we have to reduce the emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases in order to stabilise the conditions to help tropical coastal ecosystems survive the coming decades and century. This figure is from a study led by Dr. Malta Meinshausen from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Dr. Meinshausen and his team studied a very large number of climate models which link emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases to their atmospheric concentrations and ultimately to the change in global average temperature. Two broad scenarios were examined, as shown in this figure. The red family of models represents scenarios in which little is done to reduce the emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. As you see, the average temperature change by the end of the century for this group of models is around 5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial period. As we have been discussing, a temperature change of this magnitude would almost certainly remove reef building corals from tropical coastal ecosystems. The blue lines represent models which have a 60% chance of falling at or below a 2 degree Celsius increase in average global temperature above the pre-industrial period. An important observation associated with these particular models is that temperatures begin to stabilise by the middle of the current century. This is important because the stability of climate conditions is extremely important if we are to see successful adaptation of life to the changes that have and will occur in the future. So working backwards, one can ask, how much do emissions have to be reduced for us to achieve the blue family of curves? Well, here is the analysis. If we are to achieve the blue family of curves, then we must rapidly reduce emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases by 80% by 2050. The research team led by Dr. Malta Meinshausen put it another way. From the year 2000 onwards, global society has 1,000 gigatons of carbon dioxide left to emit to the atmosphere before we exceed 450 parts per million or a plus two degree increase above the pre-industrial. 
Given that we emit as a global society 35 gigatons of carbon dioxide on an annual basis, this means that roughly 500 gigatons of carbon are left to commit to the atmosphere before we exceed plus two degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial period. In other words, it means we have roughly 15 years at the current emission intensity before we must be at zero emissions in terms of fossil fuels and other greenhouse sources. This is an extremely tall order. Well, is there anything else we can do? This brings me back to the issue of reducing non-climate change related stresses on tropical coastal ecosystems. While it is an imperative that we deal with the problem of global warming and ocean acidification, we cannot take our eye off the ball when it comes to the other stresses on tropical coastal ecosystems. For example, we must deal with the problem of deforestation when it comes to mangroves if we are to give them the best chance of surviving rapid sea level rise. Equally, we must reduce the amount of sediment coming into coastal regions if we are to give seagrasses the best chance of surviving the many changes that are occurring around them. And similarly, we must reduce the extent to which we're damaging coral reefs through unsustainable coastal development, overfishing and pollution. If we can do this at the same time as reducing the extreme risks posed by global climate change and ocean acidification, then tropical coastal ecosystems will have a very good chance of surviving the coming decades and century. Take a look at the following material and explore the solutions that might be put in place to deal with both local and global stresses on tropical coastal ecosystems. As well, explore the interaction between global climate change, overfishing and coastal pollution and reef building coral communities. When you're ready, attempt the quiz to explore your knowledge retention. I want to finish this lecture with a message of hope. While the content of this lecture is quite daunting and depressing, it is important to realise that it's not too late to avert the huge challenges that we face from global climate change and local factors such as overfishing and pollution. In many ways, we're at a point in history in which human populations have the greatest chance of solving the global challenges that we've outlined here. For example, we have highly sophisticated tools that allow us to look back in time and learn from the past. Equally, we have a similar set of advanced tools for exploring how the future might unfold. And like never before, we've been able to look at our planet at a scale, a truly global scale from satellites, which is really allowing us to understand these issues at the global scale required. We also have one of the most globally connected societies in the history of our planet. There are now over one billion people carrying smartphone technology, essentially high-powered computers, with another four billion people having access to mobile phone technology. So while we have a series of monstrous challenges ahead of us, we are also at a point in history in which our capacity to solve those problems is truly unprecedented. It is a remarkable time. In the next section of the course, we begin to focus on a range of tools and technologies which will become increasingly important for solving the many problems and challenges that we've identified for the coming decades and century.